All right, Simon, in the podcast, we like to talk about the other things we've been watching, not the big things, but, you know, just the things that come across our eyeballs. So, Simon mm-hmm. Foster, do you want to kick us off? What have you been watching? Uh, we mentioned in the last segment uh, my love for the IMAX format. Uh, this week I went and saw The Blue Angels ahead of its release on Prime, Amazon Prime, which strikes me as odd. For this to not just be on constant rotation through the IMAX chain it seems seems bizarre. The Blue Angels is an inside look at the famed Air Force. Well, they're not Air Force. They're kind of standalone unit who are Navy pilots and Air Force pilots. And well, they, they operate as the where... United States Navy. Yes, well, exactly. Okay, so the Blue Angels are this extraordinary precision flying team. This is the story of how one group of Blue Angels are finishing their tenure within the within the squadron. They're welcoming in a new bunch of, of Blue Angels that they've got to train. Um, it's about the personalities, about the the uh, what their lives are like outside of the cockpit. Certainly, what their lives are like in the cockpit, as you would expect from anything like this shot for the the IMAX format. Um, it features incredible aerial sequences. Um, if you're a fan of what uh, the cruiser did in his, his Top Gun films, you are going to love something like the the Blue Angels and the footage that it captures of, of these incredible jets uh, flying in. There's this thing called the Blue Angels Diamond where their wingtips and the front of their planes are 18 inches away from the wingtips and the rear of the planes of their their um, other squadron members. It's an incredible bit of flying and it's an incredible bit of filmmaking produced by Glenn Powell, who we know from the uh, Top Gun Maverick film. And of course, your you know favourite movie of all time, Anyone But You. He, uh, along with J.J. Abrams, has um, produced this, this IMAX documentary and it's a stunning bit of, of, of big screen. It comes in just shy of being a bit militaristic. It's not quite the recruitment video the recruitment sort of um message that you might expect from that but it's not far off that so go in with a a little bit of a grain of salt look at it more as a human story than a than a flag waving rah-rah kind of uh, american military might story and you'll you'll have a, a really good time yeah cool um a film which i don't know it actually feels like the exact same movie you've just been talking about there simon uh thelma the unicorn now, I don't know how this has really gotten past you, Simon, but it is the latest kids' <laughs> film playing there on Netflix.com. Uh, this film is actually... Let me just tell you why this is probably more interesting. I love how your is. daughter programs what we're going to talk about in this podcast. <laughs> really, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, largely. Um, yeah, she was a big fan of The Eight Show. She was really into that. <laughs> but look, uh, Thelma the Unicorn, the reason why we're talking about this one, Simon, is this one cropped up on my radar because I'm always looking for things to watch with a kid. Uh, her attention span isn't really quite at feature film level just yet, but I thought this one might get across the line. Uh, it's a very bright, sparkly movie with a lot of like pop songs being sung. And the premise of it, it's about Thelma. She's a pony that lives on a pretty small farm. She's got dreams of being a famous musician with you know some of the other animals that live on the farm with her. Uh, there's a truck driver that goes past that seems to have a uh, toxic mix of um, sparkles and paint loosely attached at the back. Uh, this fairly sort of ugly horse who you can't really get auditions anywhere with her band uh, ends up being hit by this truck going by. And so she transforms from being a you know fairly average looking horse to being a very pink sparkly looking um, horse with a unicorn um, horn because a carrot that's nearby seems to get stuck to the front of her head. So very quickly she becomes an online sensation and everyone's like, oh, look, it's this singing unicorn and becomes a big pop star, whatever. As a film, it gets to maybe like the 45 minute mark and my daughter's completely into it and she's absolutely the metric we need to look at here did it hold her attention she was singing and dancing was having a great time watching this movie and then she got really really bored and i understood that because i was watching it and i got really really bored with it as well as soon as it starts sort of um feeling the enthusiasm and buoyancy that you kind of started watching the movie for and started getting a little bit serious as she gets exposed for being a fraud like her getting exposed for being a fraud should have happened like the last 10 minutes of a movie like this Okay, it should have just been a fun time, but instead, halfway through, they you know start bringing the plot into it, and it becomes just a chore. Mm-hmm. But what's particularly interesting, Simon, is the creatives behind this one. Uh, it's Jared yes. and Jerusa Hesh. 
Uh, they're probably best known for a film called Napoleon Dynamite back in the Napoleon day. Napoleon Dynamite, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Um, obviously, because those two were involved, uh, John Heater's a voice artist in this as well. Uh, but then you've got other people like my disp- despised Will Force Hayes in this one, uh, Jermaine Clenitz and uh, Fred Armisen and Zach Galifianakis. So a bunch of people that um, the Hesses have worked with in the past make their way into this as voice talent. Uh, this here, like, you know, it should be a much more fun movie than it is and doesn't really quite live up to, you know, expectation. But anyway, Film of the Unicorn, it's playing on Netflix and has been getting some pretty decent viewing numbers from what I've seen. You know what else I've been watching? I do. There is a document, well, it's on the running sheet. There is a documentary <laughs> doing the rounds at the moment called Call Me Country, Beyonce and Nashville's Renaissance. Now, uh, as a Beyonce fan, and I'm a big Beyonce fan, um, I was keen to see this. Back in March, she released her Cowboy Carter, um, dabble in the world of country music. Uh, some people saw it as a bit of a, uh, um, what's the word for it? I guess a little bit um, market driven, let's say, a little bit disingenuous that she'd try and take over the one section of the music industry that she uh, wasn't the queen of. Um, but the fact is she's got a, a she's she's from Texas she's got a long history in uh, uh both gospel and country music and 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 brings to what she does a a real understanding of country music um the launch of the album as is covered in this documentary was also met with typically um, hillbilly redneck kind of thoughts about how black people are now taking over the country music charts. This documentary proved that that's ridiculous. Um, there's been black people in country music, despite um, a section of the fan base who uh, f- say that it's just white man music um, for many, many years, and they're interviewed in this documentary. And it also speaks to how uh, Beyonce's impact on the country music scene and the uh, uh, profile that she's given um not only her record but other black music artists playing in the scene is is both a good and a bad thing a lot of a lot of uh, black musicians have been working very hard within the country music scene to to make a name for themselves they're now getting noticed because of beyonce but they should have been noticed prior to that so with this documentary reveal reveals all these elements of of what cowboy carter um and its release sort of uh, led to in the the the, the change of um perception and the change of attitudes within the country music genre i'm a fan of country music i'm certainly a fan of beyonce and i like a good documentary this runs a little short which i don't often say at about 40 minutes i thought there were some more avenues that could have gone down but it covers a lot of interesting people's um, um trajectory in the world of country music not least of which is beyonce carter uh it's called call me country it's screening on binge um and worth a look if you're a fan of anyone involved Just wrapping up the segment, Simon, uh, something I started doing during the week was going back to watch the Netflix comedy series Love. Do you remember this program at all? You know, I can honestly say that I do not, Dan Barrett. What is this about? (laughs) No, this is it. So this was a show which uh, the internet tells me was only a 2018 show. I thought it was a little bit older than that one. Uh, Basically, it was uh, Judd Apatow in the latter stage of oh, sorry no 2016 no that's right okay sorry um yeah so it was a 2016 show so this was just after um girls was maybe a pretty big success for hbo uh he was able to okay. launch his uh, tv show over on netflix so this was co-created by him a writer from girls named leslie arfin and a uh, comedian writer named paul rust anyway the show stars rust playing a uh, paul rustian type um, opposite Gillian, uh, Gillian Jacobs. Anyway, it's the two of them in a very sort of untraditional uh, rom-com style thing. Uh, Gillian, Love she, the Gillian. Yeah, she plays a... And Gillian Jacobs is a really interesting actor where she's known mostly for community, but she's done a yep. lot of indie film work where she plays some pretty edgy characters around a place. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's definitely interested in some... watching. Yeah. She's interested in more the darker side, I guess, of uh, relationships, which um, I find pretty appealing. So I really quite like her. Uh, and in this one, she plays a woman who's a uh, former alcoholic, um, sex addict, um, just a unpleasant person, just generally. 
Uh, and it's obviously the Paul Ross character who's a very hard on the sleeve kind of a guy who's um, not sure how really to deal with a character like Mickey. But the two of them, they make it work and it's very lovely and charming and funny. They got this great supporting cast. Was it a hit in the day? Why have I never heard of this? Why, why, I, I like Gillian. I like Apatel. Why, why is this not a thing? Yeah, it just kind of, it was just Netflix stuff. It just sort of came and went and, you know, mm-hmm. if you knew, you knew, but a lot of people just weren't really watching it. Uh, but Claudia O'Doherty, the Australian, um, I guess you could call her a stand-up, but she's not really a stand-up performer. She does more conceptual comedy pieces around the place. Uh, she's in this in a supporting role and she's hilarious in it. Uh, it's a very funny, just genuine laugh out loud program with um, a strong emotional, like romantic heart to this program, even though it's very honest and real and very sort of warts and all. Uh, I really, really one loved from it. from The Vault. Good fun. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this sounds good. I might go back well, and check this out. I remember out. loving this it is back. The thing in... with Netflix. Yeah. You never double back on Netflix stuff. I never go back and say, oh, once I know it's gone, and this is the same with streamers for me, it's got that. It's got sort of that that feeling of agedness about it, and I, I know I don't want to be ageist because I'm the oldest of us by a few months. And um, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the <laughs> once it, and I've got, and I've got DVDs which are the same, which I know I want to watch, and I'm glad I own, but they're just so old I don't go back to watch them. They have a, this bit of a dirtiness about them. Well, there's a lot of TV in a uh, post binge environment, so. I'm not talking about TV that we used to watch back in the day where you'd see episodes syndicated and repeated around the place. So, look, I mean, everyone's seen episodes of Seinfeld or Friends or The Simpsons, like, God knows how many times. But we were always less inclined to go back and watch drama shows again on Catch Up. Uh, We were less inclined to, you know, there's just a whole bunch of things that you never really thought you'd ever rewatch. Okay. And yeah, in streaming, like it's, you know, a bit more of a fairly disposable culture. We don't really go back and rewatch things despite, you know, some people, some sort of cult audiences might have one or two shows they go back and rewatch, but it's pretty rare that we do rewatch stuff. But I've got a fondness for love. I was thinking about it the other day and I thought, you know what, maybe I should actually go back and rewatch a couple of streaming programs. And so love was kind of at the top of my list. It still holds up remarkably well. Uh, strong recommendation. Uh, I've found myself as a viewer, not really enjoying a lot of stuff lately. Uh, it's been just a bit of a dry patch and, you know, at a time where there's fewer shows around right now because the strikes really interrupted the, you know, heavy just avalanche of programming. Plus also streamers are pulling back on how many scripts of shows they were doing. So maybe we're entering a new normal now where we do have a bit more time in our viewing um, schedules. So just fit in a few older programs or things we may have missed in the the years. Um, Love, give it a look. Uh, It may not necessarily be to your comedic tastes, but, you know, I think certainly at least worth a shot. Um, You'll either find one of your new favorite programs or you'll just see something that isn't quite really quite for you.